Um, I want to um, um, commence by thanking you for becoming involved in the area of sport. My personal experience and understanding of the research literature is sport is an important conduit through which we can support society, health and happiness. It is an excellent medium in which to encourage people into and I congratulate you for working and supporting others to engage and benefit from those things that sport can help you accrue. Um, I have um, no doubts that Anna and Kerry will share those sentiments um, in relation to <coughs> their reasons for becoming involved in uh, the Broad Sport Network. I'm going to challenge you today to think about a process and I'm going to share with you how I commenced on a journey to create organisational change within a very large commercial organisation. I have a passion for supporting people who have a disability, who experience disadvantage and who have a diversity. I think it's wrong that those groups of people don't have the same pathway to participate in sport <laughs> that others do because I think and know that they aspire to health and happiness like any other person in society. I gathered this view when I was a child, when I lived in a small country town that the glue was sport and I was astonished to see kids I was with at school absent on the weekend and never seen during the school holidays because they didn't participate in sport. I don't like that inequity. I'm also going to um, um, talk to you about a particular approach that I've taken which I want to challenge your thinking because you're interested in sustainability. When speaking initially, I noted um, what uh, an interesting group you are and you share a number of characteristics based on my observation. I've seen these characteristics in previous tranches of people who work with state sporting organisations and regional sports assemblies. And there is a major challenge which the sport industry faces in relation to moving away from a traditional approach to doing business. And I'll talk to you about that. So I'm uh, the National Disability and Diversity Manager with Belgravia Leisure. Uh, and I'm talking to you about planning for sustainability. And I'm going to show you how we've done that and how we have achieved sustainability, which is now allowing us to go on a fairly uh, substantial growth. Underpinning all of this is evidence. I was at a presentation in Sydney last week where uh, a person uh, used the phrase, data is the new oil. And that resonated with me because data, you may call it information, you may call it evidence, is the new oil in which we are driving uh, innovation, change and sustainability within a range of organisations. About us, um, we've got the shakes. I uh, don't know how that's happened, but nonetheless. Uh, Belgravia is a private group of companies uh, owned by a guy called Jeff Law uh, and his trust, his family trust. Um, it's a diverse range of companies uh, with over 6,000 employees now. Its growth over the last uh, few decades has been nothing short of staggering. And one of the companies within that group is Belgravia Leisure, and it manages leisure facilities on behalf of an owner. And typically the owner, 97%, uh, are local government. And that's a really important thing to understand because local government is just one of the levels of government which has a direct impact on sport and leisure within the country. And understanding that has helped us um, grow the success. And we're in New Zealand now, we've been there for 18 months, and we've got uh, uh, 15 venues, I think, uh, in New Zealand. So I just want to set the scene. I've not always worked in this industry. I started as a PE teacher because I was astounded to find out that you could end up being paid to be involved in sport. That was one of the great sort of uh, awakenings of my life when I was um, uh, still in school. <coughs> and so over time I, I did a range of things, but I was always interested in this issue to do with inequity. So let me set the scene. This was back when I was working in a university. And by training, I became an evidence-based practitioner. Evidence was useful for me to substantiate um, growth or innovation and to defend 
current practice as needed. So I worked um, uh, at RMIT University and on the campus there was a brand new sport facility built in 2002, managed internally for a period of time for five years uh, and it was a financial black hole. I mean it was so deep you could not find the bottom of the profit and loss statement propped up by the university. The university then decided to outsource it and it went to Belgravia Leisure. Concurrently, to give students within the undergraduate program a first positive experience working with people with disability in the sport, physical activity and exercise areas, we created a thing called Creating a Sporting Chance. And it was a, pro a program uh, run on bringing people onto the university um, uh, space, which was a community sport facility run with the city of Whittlesea, to enjoy, well, sport. Um, and we collected information. We collected a lot of information. We collected information about patronage, about the benefits for the participants, but not just those participants, the stakeholders. So those people providing direct support, their parents, different sports. We collected information around the benefits, but I also collected information about financial impact. I did that because in the metrics which were important for sustainability of what we started and then growth, I needed evidence to substantiate that the business of that sports area had grown as a direct consequence of attacking inequity. I'm not sure, but at the moment, most sports facilities throughout Victoria would be vacant or in low patronage mode. Yeah, 10.30 on a Tuesday morning. But you can make money from that time if you target your market correctly. So that's one of the things that we did. So from that grew evidence and trust. One of the things that then was an, uh, an outcome was that we ended up being very successful with a whole range of awards. That was not of great interest to me or the others. It was a natural byproduct of what we were doing. We went from a single program to 15 programs with patronage around 12,000 visitations per year. And we were full. We bought the uh, venue up to an 81% usage rate, which is unheard of within the industry. One of the things that I discovered though, was sitting and talking to people at award ceremonies was the staggering situation that most of them failed to continue 12 to 18 months after initiation. And almost all of them, it was as a consequence of no recurrent funding. And there was almost a bitterness associated with, well, the local government didn't give us another grant, or the state government didn't give us another grant. And that really sort of made me think, is there this truism that seems to exist within the sports sector around the notion that there's an entitlement to recurrent money from government. And I think there is. And I think that needs to be challenged. And if you think about the broader society, we're moving away from that. And I can show you lots of evidence to substantiate that if you choose. The other thing that I noticed that was never planning for sustainability. They got $15,000 and they spent it. And then they went back for more money and they were told, well, no, you're not getting more money. You're supposed to now organize it for yourself. So in 2014, um, when I finished at the university, uh, Belgravia Leisure at that time had no national approach to inclusion and access. I had developed a relationship with a number of the uh, people in the organization and it became apparent to me um, that there was a great opportunity that they needed to be made aware of and then shown the direction toward. And so I spoke to them and said, I've got a good idea. Give me a job. And it's this job to do this. 
And they talked to me and they said, well, why? And I gave them three dot points, which I'd gone prepared with. And I said, because it'll increase your market share, it'll increase your business reputation, and you will be more successful as a business. They will not resolve from an opportunity to grow the business. And they said, fine, Jeff, develop a business case. Well, I did, and I used all of this information. And as a consequence, at the end of the year, I was appointed as National Disability and Diversity Manager, completely funded from within the commercial organisation to address those areas of disability, diversity and disadvantage. So, planning for sustainability was at the forefront of my mind. I had to set myself a personal challenge to see whether a commercial organisation could embrace and then empower this notion that disability, diversity and disadvantage was core business. So, one of the things that I thought about was what are the core principles? And one of the things that I understood early on was that pleading had a short shelf life and as a consequence it would lead to disappointment. For want of a better term, and I am being uh, provocative, but expecting a handout, expecting recurrent funds from government or any organisation is a challenge in this environment. Those days are fast disappearing. So partnership and planning seem to me to be the great things that we should be doing. And as a consequence, we set about a, a plan to create financial viability, sustainability and then growth. And we did this in a really systematic approach because as I said to you before, I come from an evidence-based practice. I'm trained as a researcher. And so we did it in five venues only in Melbourne to trial it. And that would help me build some trust. The core features of these was that we had to partner with the community and the local stakeholders to understand what were the needs, preferences and priorities of the community in which we worked. Because if we weren't meeting their needs, their priorities and their preferences, why would they then use the services that we were offering? So we needed to identify. It's called a community development model. Additionally, we identified a person within the uh, facility to be an inclusion coordinator, uh, a first point of contact, who went out into the community but also worked internally. It was five hours per week. And we had to gather information now the core thing was of what information? Now the question that I've got for you <coughs> is that what is the primary driver among adults with a disability for inclusion in sport? Why do they do it? If you don't know that answer, then you're poorly positioned to create sustainable programs that will support people with a disability to be involved in your sport. And there's good evidence out there to tell us what exactly it is. And the same thing for children. And the same thing for people of diversity. And the same thing for people who experience disadvantage. The evidence is there. So we understood what were the things were the drivers. You may call them the enablers or the facilitators. And we wanted to do that um, uh, so that we would guide our own improvement to make sure we're meeting the needs of our consumer base. We wanted to confirm the impact in these five venues because I was enjoying my work and I wanted to continue it and I wanted to try and create benefit for all of those groups that I'm uh, passionate about supporting. But I wanted to also build trust. So this is just one example. There's too much information on this slide for you. But this was a really carefully considered first project that I led. And it did a whole range of things which meant the executives of the company that I work with and the sports with which we partnered with really enjoyed the outcome. So we ran at the Diamond Valley Sports and Fitness Centre uh, an indoor netball and indoor football program in term two of 2015. So that's within that first six months, remember, of my five, uh, six month trial with five venues. And in essence, we brought in 180 teens uh, with an intellectual disability, um, a lot of teachers from a lot of schools. We partnered with Sports Education uh, Development Academy, now called Cedar College. Why did I want to partner with them? Because I needed a lot of 
sports coaches at no cost. That's what I needed. So I had to think, what could I partner, what could I give as a partner? And what I gave them as an experience which linked into their curriculum that they could not get from anywhere else. So they came on board, and I'll explain how important that first experience with CEDAR has been. I work with Netball Victoria and Footy Federation Victoria. Might have some representatives here from there, a couple of Belgrade staff. But the most important thing that we did after the partnership approach was we get gathered information. And I gathered all of that information. Why did I gather that information? It's not a rhetorical question. Sorry? To provide the evidence for the next step. For growth, for trust, for confidence. So we gathered information. I spent a fair bit of time collecting this information because I thought it would be a great investment for the future. So this is some of the data that will come out. For the benefit from the, these are the teachers, the senior teachers responsible for these student leaders. And remember during this first experience that we impacted on uh, close to 160 to 170 of these young people. Don't even bother um, to, uh, too much with what are the different things that we collected. Just have a look where they are on the right hand side. How high they are near the peak. In essence, the teachers responsible for the CEDA student leaders thought the program was outstanding for their development. The student, and the student leaders also indicated that they thought that the program was excellent for their personal development. And the school teachers who were responsible for bringing along these 180 teens with a disability likewise thought the program was excellent. I then used that collateral to go back to my organisation and say that here is a way forward. And I went back to these organisations and I reported to all of them so that they were aware of what was uh, the outcomes for their organisation. So as a consequence of the six month trial on these five venues and reviewing it with, within my organisation, which is a commercial organisation, um, I presented the evidence to what's called the executive leadership team, the CEO, um, you know, the chief operating officer and a few things like this. And remember, we're a hundred million dollar a year company. It's a massive company. And so uh, I showed them the evidence, I showed them the financials, I'm not showing you, and they looked at it and they said, go ahead. And so what we then did was to board in an additional 10 venues to roll out the strategy. And I then took the information to our state conferences where our 350 middle management people in the five states that we operated in Australia confirmed disability and diversity as one of the two national priorities. Because I presented it as a business opportunity to them which would allow for business success. And it's all come from planning for sustainability and gathering evidence. The business owner then at the end of the year, and I had no idea that this was coming, at um, uh, two major functions announced that he had an intention to leave five legacy outcomes. And he specifically named disability and diversity. He said he understood better what the opportunity was. He said, I've had a successful business career, and one of the things that I'm going to leave as a legacy is an outstanding uh, organisation supporting people with a disability of disadvantage and diversity to connect to leisure. So we got massive uh, support from that. So I asked you this question before. So what is the answer to this question? You don't have to put your hand up. But what enabler is mentioned most by adults with a disability when describing what they seek most through participation in sport. Community participation, social connection, opportunities to rest and rest, or health and fitness. And the answer is social connection. And the evidence is quite clear on this. But many of the sport, uh, sport community think it's they want to play sport. Sport's just a conduit to connect with others, to build friendships, acquaintanceships, and to enjoy life. And you need to understand that core 
driver and use it to connect people to your sport. And that's coming off of evidence. So we understand this, and one of the things that we're now doing is that we are collecting evidence often, all the time, around whether our programs are addressing the needs of one of our large consumer groups. So if you have a look over here, this is one of our programs we run called Swim Champs, and there's a series of questions here uh, which we ask around the benefits for the swimmer, the benefits for their family, and then things about the organisation of the program. And there's also a little question down here, um, this one here. Uh, I can't see it, my eyes are not that good. There's a question there which we build into a thing called a net promoter score, which is in sport industry, leisure industry, fitness industry, um, piece of information which you compare with one number across everything. And I'll explain that in a moment. So basically what we've been able to do then is to understand what the evidence is about the drivers for people with a disability. And we um, very energetically pursue the achievement of the drivers for the consumers. Um, this is a way that we're doing it, and this is far too much data, and you just need to look at the charts on the right hand side. Right on the right hand side, in terms of the benefits for the swimmers, the benefits for families, and the features of the SOARS program, you can see that the respondents, and this is from three different states where we've collected this data, are very happy <coughs> about the uh, benefits that are accruing for them. Now, um, why do I collect this sort of information? Because we compete for business, and you will compete for business uh, in the future as you are today and you have in the past. And so we compete for business by going to local government. Remember I said about 95, 97% of the uh, facilities are owned by local government? Well, what do you think are some of the priorities for local government? Well, you, it's all publicly available. You go and look at their websites and you read. And their priorities are those who experience disability, disadvantage, and diversity. Any form, it could be older um, uh, people, those who um, uh, are unemployed, all of those sorts of things. They are the priorities for local government. So I take this information along and I sit in our, our tender uh, presentations when we compete for business, and I present the information, the evidence, the proof that we deliver excellence in leisure service management. And I specifically target their policies and their strategies. And I'll say, on that item, this is how we deliver. On that item, this is how we deliver. And that whole notion resonates with these people who then make decisions about the allocation of the contracts. So in, um, uh, remember when I first became involved with Belgravia Leisure that, uh, in 2007, they had 60 venues, it's now up to 120. So that's a doubling of the business within that last um, uh, 10 years, which is substantial because we do lose contracts, but for everyone we lose, we're picking up about 2.5. So we're finding that this evidence is a real driver. And I talked to you about a thing called a net promoter score. That's a score that comes out of a question about the likelihood of a person to recommend their experience to another person, or whether they're passive about it, or whether they are a detractor about it. You would want people to be an active promoter of the experience in the sport that you work in. And so do we. And so if you have a look down the bottom here, this net promoter score, for the programs related to swimming and disability that we offer, we have a net promoter score of 71. It ranges from zero, which is um, uh, very low, to 100, which is um, every person recommends the program. In the fitness industry, the most recent data available indicates that a score of 19 is average for the industry. 
And I'm able to show that for the areas I'm responsible for, it's up in the 70s. That exceeds Google. That exceeds BHP. Matter of fact, it exceeds almost everything. And when I'm able to put that forward, people then say, okay, there's clearly something that's happening here from the perspective of the consumers that we wish to attract. Um, so I'll just give you another one. Um, and I'll put up there, you know, sort of uh, show me the money because one of the things that you will struggle with is um, uh, the difficulty of having sufficient funds. And remember, I started with zero money. We have received no government funding. That is zero government funding. I'm employed. We have 50 inclusion coordinators across the country within two years and three months. And we've done this because we've proved that we are financially viable, we are sustainable, and we lead to business growth. In a commercial entity, there are no more important things. So here's an example in Melbourne from uh, a regional um, uh, aquatic facility. Uh, sorry, not regional, on the uh, periphery of the uh, uh, metropolitan area that we run. When we started with the model in this venue, um, there were 12 people with a disability that were involved in any of the swimming and water safety programs. And uh, as of December of 2016, we'd grown that up to 132. That's across kids, teens and adults in a whole range of different groups. We're not just about providing programs for people with a disability in isolation. We have what we call a pathway to aquatic independence. We want every kid to be safe around water, but use water to enjoy life. And so there's a whole range of things. The patronage, uh, when you total up how regularly people come in, is 6,500 visitations by swimmers, 2,500 by um, uh, uh, people accompanying them, primarily families. And so that brings it up to 9,000. I actually know what the spend is from those individuals on average within that facility. I know how much they spend, and that's important commercially. When you add, when you just look at the yield from the running of the programs, this is the profit we make. It's not the revenue, right? It's the yield. It's the money that goes into the bank. From this program, after 18 months, is $28,000. And we've got an inclusion coordinator who spends five hours per week. And you can do the sums. You can do the sums. Now, those people are not receiving any government funding. So they're coming to us as consumers. Additionally, there's a net promoter score of 100 within this facility. Because the staff have embraced it. So 15 um, staff. Uh, volunteered their time, it was paid by the organisation to do the OSWEB uh, Making Aquatic, Aquatics a Terrific Experience workshop. Fifteen of them gave up their own time. Two of them went on and completed the um, Swimming and Water Safety Access and Inclusion course. The venue also, these staff then said, look, we'll give a bit more of our time and work with the local organisation, partnered with them to help them raise money and they've raised $5,000 over two events over two years. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, one of the staff was the uh, Vic Swim uh, Access and Inclusion Award winner. So, let's just update the scene then. So, Belgravia now operates 120 venues in Australia and New Zealand. We've got these 50 donators uh, a year round venues, and we have moved. You can do the sums and figure out how much it would cost a commercial organisation. Uh, our program evaluation confirms the multifaceted benefits for our participants families, stakeholders, and, uh, and local government. That's information. Data is the new oil. It is the new oil. And I'll sh uh, expand on that in just a moment. The financial information confirms the financial viability. I've done an audit of, of all of our programs in 2016, and I know how much money we're making. And I'm not interested in money. I'm interested in inclusion and access, but money is the conduit to get me there. And so I had to plan for sustainability. 
and I had to substantiate the benefits and the business potential of working in this area. Partnerships have escalated and we now work with over 50 separate organisations across the country. And this morning as I was driving in, I was on the phone talking to some people about um, you know, how we're going to grow up some partnerships. Um, you would know these people because they're quite prominent within the sporting sector. So, um, as a consequence of this, and for some reason in microprint, I don't know what's happened here, but inclusion and access is sustained and it's growing in venues operated by Belgravia Leisure. So, my story to you today is that I didn't believe the truism the disability, diversity and disadvantage required recurrent government funding. I couldn't believe it because I'd worked for three decades in this area as my passion. I just happened to get a job where I was able to inspire that someone paid me to pursue my passion. And then, for three decades, I saw these programs come and go. Come and go on the funding side. And as a consequence, I thought there had to be a better way. And through chance, but then taking my luck and then expanding on it, we collected information at the Bundura Netball Sports Centre. That was a black hole I mentioned. As a consequence of the programs at Bundura, <coughs> we moved it into profit. Just, but we moved it into profit. And that then cemented the programs uh, there. So I implore you to think about gathering information, to use that evidence to then drive sustainability. But you must know what information to collect. I've left a um, series of my business cards, and I'm not hard to find. Um, you know, you all use some form of social media, and, and I will pop up uh, there. So um, I'm happy to talk with you, uh, provide support and provide uh, advice because I'm very, very keen on you doing your best to address inequity and making sure everyone gets a chance to be connected to um, sport. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yes. And what's the price for you charging for the um, For the uh, Northern Special School Sports one, the first one we ran, $2.50 per person, per session. The shock you had me. $2.50. That's half of your latte. <laughs> now that price point is carefully chosen. When we were running the programs at Bundora Netball and Sports Centre, we started at at $1.50. But I looked at partnerships because I could get the major costs taken by another organisation. So we had undergraduate students who came at no cost. I had CETA students who came at no cost. <coughs> now, in your broad area, you work with a large no cost group as well. Who are they? Volunteers. Volunteers. And so, but I had to meet the needs of CEDA. I had to meet the needs of the undergraduate students. And when I met those needs, they said, let's come back. So NSSA now are regularly approaching us, asking us to we'll run programs. And consequently, we've run an additional um, two major programs for them. And we would run more, but we just don't have the facilities to do it. We charge commercial rates in commercial time, by the way, because people and, uh, with a disability, uh, people with diversity, those who experience disadvantage, will pay for quality when you meet their needs, their priorities and their preferences. And even though it's not going to be really well connected to what you're doing, but the National Disability Insurance Scheme does have a little bit of a link into the sporting area. If you organise it correctly, we're a provider for the NDIS. We'll be providing connection to sport. Paid by the federal government. 
So there is, there is a way. But the message I want you to take home is you need to know what your consumers want. You need to collect information that you've delivered on what your consumers want. You need to then communicate that information to the decision makers to build confidence, trust and sustainability. Is there one way that's much more efficient than others to gather that information about what the community wants and what they need to preference? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is that I always start slowly and small. And I cherry pick a project. A single project to gather the information, which then allows me to grow the collateral, the evidence, which then builds the confidence and trust and I expand. So in everything that I've ever done, I'll always start small and then I want to be successful so it spreads. I do always collect information specifically addressing the needs of those that I want to get um, cooperation from. So there's the parents bringing a child to a swimming lesson. I don't just ask about the benefits for the swimmers. I ask about the benefits for their families. If you want to see some reports around this, go and have a look at a, um, a small not-for-profit organisation called Emotion 21. And I led two research projects for them which collected a lot of information which informed them about what their dancers, what their families wanted, which has now driven their decision making. So you need to uh, identify what that is, and, but always start out really small. And it just, in terms of small, I'm talking, uh, it may be something you're running once a week with 10 people. Understand what their needs are. If you don't know, the easiest thing to do is ask them. Then to go and check in the literature to see whether that's confirmed. Kerry? What's the future of Belgravia Leisure in terms of the inclusion space? Well, domination, Kerry. Yes. <laughs> And uh, you know, that role of the coordinator being five hours per week, do you think that's enough? Um, it was, um, so the answer is um, uh, it'll be depending on the venue. And the idea is that they required, so this was a business decision, they required to allocate five. And the manager is then expected to grow the business. And so my role is to provide an approach support, guidance, and a few other things, and then locally we build the capacity. And as a consequence, they then are in a position to build the revenue, which then drives the allocation to more time for an inclusion coordinator. But one of the other key things is, I'm uh, very anti the disability person or the diversity person, or the disadvantaged person. In my view, that's an anachronism. We're all in that space. And I'm just trying to convince my organisation that we're in this space. And so the person who's the inclusion coordinator is a conduit for the community development model to reach out and connect with the community in its broadest <coughs> sense and to bring that back internally and connect, connect with the community within the leisure space. So this disability person is not running the programs. I sort of fairly assertively discourage that. It's all of our staff who are involved in this. Look, another way where the, sort of the partnerships comes about, uh, we're very soon to launch a um, um, a training system for all of our staff and the only way we can do it is online and I've been able to work with an organisation for the last uh, eight to nine months where they're giving us free unfettered access to the resources that they've developed up. We've helped them refine them so that they specifically meet the needs from our perspective of inclusion in the leisure centre space and so 6,000 staff within our organisation will be uh, expected to complete that training uh, and then every employee of ours, it will be part of the expectations. So everyone will be trained in inclusion, access and disability. And we'll move on to the other areas as well. I've got that for zero dollars. Not costing us anything because I put in time at the front end to help them and I'm meeting their needs. 
And as a consequence, we're getting reciprocity, we're meeting our needs. Thanks much, Jeff. We may have to no, yeah, yeah, I'm done. you bicycle around the morning tea, which is in half an hour. Yeah, I'll no, probably go off to a couple of other meetings. I have left my business cards here, as I mentioned to Tom. More than happy to um, uh, provide some advice and guidance. To you, it may seem overwhelming. Uh, I purposely wanted to be provocative uh, this morning because I'm one of you. <coughs> and I've seen people like you with outstanding intent since I moved to Victoria in 1987. And about three years ago, I thought, I've got to do something about this. And I've been training and training. There's a few people in this room that I've trained who've gone through university with me. But I need to then see if I could actually then make a change within an organisation. So that's the way we've gone. Uh, data risk in the world. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Jeff.